Good morning. Thanks for, for joining us today for our luncheon conversation as part of our Aging at Altitude series. Today's topic is financial health and understanding annuities, a very interesting topic for sure. My name is Al Manzi. I'm the president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media and, and publisher for both the Times Call and the Daily Camera. Today, we're very fortunate to have Ron Verosik. Um, he, Ron is a tax and financial consultant uh, with Financial Intact and also is an author. Uh, Ron will speak to us today for about 35 to 45 minutes. Uh, and afterwards, we'll have a very lively Q, uh, question and answer uh, session. Um, the question and answer session will finish as soon as Ron is done. And uh, you can put your questions um, into the, qu the Q&A function or the chat function and I'll read them uh, as we move through the question and answer period. Uh, I would also like to remind you to please to visit our Aging and Altitude website and take a virtual tour of our partners and their services. Please join me in welcoming Ron Verosik. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. So I am Ron Verosik, and I am the author of Financially Intact. That's one of my two books. The other one was written uh, about 20 years ago. That one was called um, Windows of Miss Opportunity. So I want to thank you for joining today. And right before I get into the annuities, I want to cover one small thing that uh, there's basic, three basic elements to investing. I think if you understand that, and this is only going to take like two minutes before we get to the topic. If you understand this three basic elements, you, it's going to help in understanding annuities a whole lot better. So those three elements are, of course, the safety risk element, uh, the time element, and the yield element. And what is important to understand is that if you want more of any one of those elements, you have to give up some of one of the other elements. So the easy way to explain this is, let's just look at bank CDs for a second. If, why does a five-year pay more than a one-year? Well, because there's more time. You're going to let the bank hold that money for a longer period of time. So that's the time element. So if you let them hold it for longer, they're willing to pay you more. So like I said, you always have to give up one or some of one to get more of another. On the other side of that spectrum would be, of course, basically the stock market. Now in the stock market, you don't have to worry about time. You, you can do it in a matter of minutes or days or, or whatever you want. And you can earn a whole lot more than you would in a bank. You, you could possibly earn, you know, 10, 20% on your money, but you have to give up your safety element to your safety and risk element. In other words, yeah, you could make 10 or 20%, but you could also lose 10 or 20%. So like I said, whenever you're going to get more of one of those three elements, you have to give up some of one of the other elements. So now that we have that um, hopefully understood, we're going to go into the presentation about annuities. We're going to uh, go fairly deeply into annuities so that hopefully you're going to understand these a whole lot better at the end. And please do feel free to ask uh, any questions that you may have. Okay, where did this go? Okay, so, sorry, give me one second here. Okay, so understanding annuities. The things we're going to cover today to hopefully help you to understand them a whole lot better at the end is one, what are annuities? What are the four types of annuities? The two main ways annuities are used, there's actually two major ways, and how to decide how much you should have in annuities if they are appropriate for you. So let's get started. First, the history of annuities. The word annuity comes from the Latin word annua. Uh, which means annual. The Romans were trying to conquer the world and so they were running all over the world and, and with all their soldiers and that was costing them a whole lot of money. Hey Ron, so what, yes. Sorry, really quick. I don't see your PowerPoint. I only see your um, Google tab. Huh. 
Give me one second here. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, I did hit the wrong one. Okay. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes. <clears throat> second. Okay. Now we're okay? Okay, perfect. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the Romans, they went and told their people they had to borrow the money from their citizens and so what they said is if you will loan us the money so that we can go fight these wars in trade we will give you an annual stipend or an annual payment for as long as you live because i was always worried with people about how do you stay alive once you can no longer work or you have no money coming in so they actually invented the idea of annuities here in America, they actually started being used in 1912. And that's always struck me as just a little bit strange because annuities, one of the great things about it you're going to see here in a second is that they're tax deferred. And yet we didn't have a tax code till 1913. So that might say somebody knew something was coming <laughs> that they invented the, or started using the tax deferred annuities before the tax code even existed. So how are annuities used or, or why are they used? And like I said, they provide tax deferred growth. Tax de deferred growth allows your money to grow faster. And so I have this little chart here just to help explain that of why holding on to your money longer helps you make more money. So what I did on the uh, left-hand column there, it says tax deferred. And so we take $1 and we double our money and we got, we're going to do this one, two, three, four times. On the right side, we're going to double our money, but we're going to pay the tax as it goes. So the left side, we're just going to double our money and we'll pay the tax at the end and we will even pay a higher tax. And on the right side, we're going to pay the tax as it goes. So year one, we start with our dollar. At the end of the year, we have $2 in the tax deferred account, but in the uh, taxed side of it, because we paid 22% on our $1 of earnings, we only have $1.78. So then the next year we double from $2 to $4 on the tax deferred side. On the tax side, we add $1.78 because we only, that's what we could double is the $1.78. And then we only get to keep 78% of that because of the 22% tax. So we actually only get to add $1.39 to that side. But as you can see at the bottom, after the end of the fourth year, again, fifth year, now on the tax deferred side, we have $16. So even if we paid a higher tax rate of 28% as compared to the 22, we would still be left with $11.52. Whereas on the right side, we only have $10.04. So even though we were paying less taxes as we were paying all along, it did not let us hold on to our money and make the extra money with our, our original money. So that's how tax deferred works. I do have that in, um, both my books, as a matter of fact, if you ever want to see that chart, just let us know. So um, the other way it helps with tax deferral, it can help you actually pay less taxes in two ways. The first one, um, I call it in both my books, I call it the flow control. I'm going to give you a brief summary of that here. Now, I know these numbers aren't what you can get right now today. Well, sometimes you can, but anyway, if we take $150,000 and say, let's just say we're earning 3%, I have to keep the math simple here for myself. Um, that gives you $4,500 of spendable taxable income, okay? So if we took that $150,000 and we separated it into three buckets, three $50,000 buckets, and then we're still earning our 3%, each of those buckets would earn $1,500 of interest. And so um, that would give us 51.5, except for instead of taking out the interest out of all three buckets, we're just gonna take $4,500 out of bucket number one, and we're gonna leave buckets number two and three in tax deferred status. A lot of people tell me, no, I don't wanna do this because I don't wanna use my principal. Well, this is why the, I did this whole chart is so that you could see you're not using principal. You, you're, I guess you are out bucket number one, but you're replacing that principal in buckets two and three. So at the end of the year, after we take out our $4,500 out of bucket one, we now have $47,000 left in bucket number one, but we have 51.5 in both buckets one or two and three. You add those three numbers together, lo and behold, 
you still have $150,000. The difference is we only pay taxes on $1,500 instead of on $4,500. So once again, if you're in that 22% tax break or tax bracket and you just did not pay taxes on $3,000, you know, that just saved you basically um, 660 bucks. So you have the same money, you have the same income, all you changed was how much you're sending to Uncle Sam and how much more you get to save, keep, spend, earn more interest with on, you know, in coming years. So that's how tax deferral goes. Now, the other way that tax, uh, annuities can help you save on taxes, at least here in Colorado, is that all monies coming out of annuities in Colorado and many other states are considered retirement income. Therefore, they qualify for the pension exclusion. This boosts your earnings by over 4%. The Colorado state tax is 4.63 or 4.67%. It does not give you a 4% return on your money. Don't misjudge how I, I said these words. It saves you over 4% of your earnings. So let's say on $100 of interest coming out of a savings account, you would have to pay $4 in taxes. But if you took that same $100 of earnings out of an annuity, it would cost you nothing because so long as you still fit within the uh, pension exclusion. If you've already used up your whole pension exclusion, then of course that wouldn't apply to you. But most people do not max out that pension exclusion. And so there's money left over there um, to work this with. So now that we've talked about them a little bit, we're going to get into the basics. And there's four types of annuities. There are the immediate annuities, there are the fixed annuities, there are the fixed indexed annuities, and then there's the variable annuities. We're going to talk about each one of these and hopefully um, explain to you so that you understand them a whole lot better at the end of this. An immediate annuity. It's like the word says, immediate, it starts now. So you give your money over to an insurance company. Only insurance companies can do annuities. You give them money this month and they start paying you next month. And they will pay you. There are many ways to get paid out on annuities. The most common is a lifetime payment. So in other words, it's guaranteeing you that you will have a monthly check for as long as you live, no matter how long that is, no matter even if the money in the account runs out, there's no money left. It's under contract. The insurance company has to keep paying you for as long as you live. And um, we'll get into a little bit more of that here in just a second. But also it's determined um, how much you get is determined by your age and the prevailing interest rate because they cannot predict what the interest rates are going to be in the future. So they have to use today's interest rate and they're going to figure out, okay, so, you know, if you're 69 years old, and there's a good chance you're gonna make it 89 years, then basically they know they have to provide this monthly income for at least 20 years. And so they're gonna look at how much money you have right now to create this income. And then what is the prevailing interest rate? Because that's what they're going to have to tie it up uh, for a long period of time, 20 or 30 years. Um, basically they have to go with long-term investments so that they can guarantee to give you all of your money. The other thing, like I said, uh, last lifetime, we're going to get into it a little bit later because some people also misconstrue that thinking, well, what if I die early or, or quicker than I thought I was going to? Does the insurance get company get to keep my money? And there is one type of annuity that nobody should ever uh, choose that can do that. But most of the others, you'll see you have different ways around that to make sure that somebody in your family gets that money. Immediate annuities have been around for a long time. People don't even realize that a lot of people have been um, gathering money off of an immediate annuity, except for they always called it their pension and it was their pension. This is how most pensions were built in America is the company set aside the money. And then at the end, they gave it to an insurance company and the insurance company gave, produced an immediate annuity and started paying out to the people. So like my mother-in-law, um, she had, retired from Montgomery Wards many years ago, obviously before they went bankrupt. But anyway, she retired a few years after she retired, Montgomery Wards went bankrupt, but she always got her check 
all the way to the very last day for as long as she lived because what Montgomery Wards did is they took the money, they gave it to a company called Sun Life. It's an insurance company in Canada and Sun Life issued those checks to my mother-in-law for the next 20 years or whatever, uh, up until uh, she passed away. So most pensions, that's exactly how they're built, built is with intermediate annuities. Like I said, so, you know, people have been using them for years and never even knew they had them basically. So now the next annuity I want to talk about is the fixed annuity. Now, these are also called MIGAs, M-Y-G-A. And that stands for multi-year guaranteed annuities. They come in several terms. The most common are three-year, five-year, seven-year, and 10-year terms. Now, they work just like a CD, except for in some ways they're better. And they're better because they're more flexible and they pay better than uh, CDs do. Um, so that's what's good about them. On the other hand, what I guess you could consider is worse than CDs is that they do run for longer periods of time. So uh, remember at the beginning, I said, whenever you want more of something, you have to give up something else. Well, this is one of those prime examples is for more time, they're willing to pay you more dollars. And so we give up one to get something else. Why I say they pay better currently, if you looked at a three-year CD, and I just did this on bankrate.com, you could go there and look up, the national average is actually, well, no, I'm not going to say the national average. The current highest ones that you can find are 0.75, there was, I think, one that was 0.85%, and then a couple others that were lower than that. The national average for a three-year CD was actually less than a half of 1%. Whereas your three-year MIGAs, M-I-G-A's, multi-year guaranteed annuities, is 1.75. I cannot, unfortunately, mention those company names right here and now on this kind of a setting without having gotten their permission at first, uh, you know, beforehand and all that. And there are several companies that do this. But if you want to call us later on, I will gladly tell you who it is and tell you more about how to do that. So anyway. The other thing that's neat about annuities, um, some annuities, not quite all of them, but most of them, um, is that they are more flexible than a CD. So let's say you have $50,000 and you have it in a CD and you break a tooth. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, but dentists cost a lot of money. Maybe you broke two teeth. And so you need to take you know, $5,000 out of your $50,000 CD. Well, what happens with the bank is you have to break that $50,000 CD and um, you pay a penalty on the whole 50,000. You lose your interest, six months worth of interest or three months, whatever the case may be, on the entire $50,000 just to get your $5,000 out to meet this low emergency that you had. With most of the annuities, either by choice and so you earn a little bit less or some of them just have it built in even at their uh, price levels, um, you can usually take out 10% of your principal without paying a penalty. So now you have $50,000 in annuity, you take $5,000 out to fix your broken teeth and it doesn't cost you anything. You get to take it out. There's no penalty on the $5,000. There's no penalty on the other $45,000 and the other 45,000 keeps working and earning your, in this particular case, 1.75%. And you could do it again the next year if you want it. Now you usually can't do it in the first year, but you can do it in years two, three and beyond if you go with one of the longer ones. So like I said, CDs usually quit at five years, whereas uh, the multi-year guaranteed annuities do run out to seven and 10 years. I would not recommend those currently because they're not paying enough more interest to make it worth tying up your money for that much longer. I hate to <laughs> keep beating this horse, but I could keep saying, you always have to give up something to get something. And that's what you have to take into consideration here and go, okay, if I'm only gonna get a quarter percent more, is that worth tying up my money for another five years? I'd say no, because chances are within the next three to five years, we might get back to more normal interest rates. Sooner or later, it's gonna happen. So there you have fixed annuities. And now we have fixed indexed annuities. Now, these are the hardest to understand because there are so many varieties and there's so many like moving parts and ways of determining how much interest they're going to pay you. The basic concept is that interest is paid on the, the interest paid on these 
is tied to the performance of the market, but yet it is not invested inside of the market. Therefore, they cannot lose money. These things are 100% guaranteed. You cannot lose money. Once again, I'm going to repeat that. They're tied to the performance of the market, but they are not invested in the market. Therefore, you cannot lose money. Here we go again, time, yield, and risk concept. So because they're tied to the performance of the market, you might think, oh, well, these can make a whole lot of money. No, and you're going to see this here in just a minute. I'll explain it. But because they're risk-free, you're not going to get what you would normally get if you're inside of uh, the market. So you're only going to get a portion of it. In time, once again, we have five-year ones, we have seven-year ones, we have nine-year ones, we have 10-year ones, some go even longer than that. But there's lots of, like I said, kind of moving parts in here. And we can find one that fits um, your scenario and, and what you need it to do for you. So let's talk about how these work, because this is confusing. This is one of those things. I remember in 1995 when they first came out and they, somebody was telling me about them. I'm going, this is way too good to be true. That it's not possible. And so uh, I had one of the guys come out actually from Kansas City and explain it to me. And this is how he explained it to me. And once you see it and understand the workings, um, the inside workings, then it totally makes sense. You go, okay, this, I can see exactly why these work. So for this example, and this is where I wish this was live because I, I can draw this out better than just doing it with words is, is a little difficult. But anyway, so we have $100,000 and we give that to the insurance company. Well, the insurance company knows their average return on their investments is like three or three and a half percent is what they could pay on it if they so chose to because that's what they can make. But they don't guarantee that you're going to make anything on a fixed index annuity. All they guarantee is that your money is safe and they will give it all back to you. You, you cannot lose any of your money. So with that in mind, and they're making 3%, they know that if they invest just $75,000 at 3% in 10 years, they're gonna have the $100,000 to give back to you, which is the guarantee. They guarantee they're going to give you your money back. This leaves them with $25,000 to buy the options on the market. We'll get to that in the next screen. Therefore, your return is tied to the market, but your money is not invested in the market. Therefore, you cannot lose. So with that $25,000, like I said they buy the option. Now, I want to explain options just real briefly here because it's important to understand this concept to understand the index annuity. So an option is the right to buy something at a given time, at a given price, but not the obligation. And repeat that. It is the right to buy something at a given time, at a given price, but not the obligation. So you can buy it, but you don't have to buy it. So basically the insurance company has $25,000 to use to buy options over the next 10 years or approximately $2,500 per year. And this is why index annuities do not get the full movement of the market. So they're going to go to Wall Street and they're going to say, okay, I want to buy, this is just an example, but one that's used a lot. I want to buy the S&P 500 index one year from today, but at today's price. And so Wall Street goes, okay, well, we'll make that deal with you, but it's going to cost you, you know, $5,000, $6,000. The insurance company goes, I don't have five or $6,000 to give you right now on this. And so the Wall Street goes, well, how much do you have? They go, well, we've got $2,500. So Wall Street thinks about it and they go, okay, they, they work out their magic math and they go, we will give you 30% of the return on the market. They're 35 or 40. And they, depending on interest rates, these numbers move like quite a bit. Uh, I've seen as low as 25, I've seen as high as 80. Um, it depends on, on preventing interest rates. So anyway, then the insurance company goes, okay, we'll take the 30% of the movement of the market for the $2,500. Well, let's say at the end of the first year, you know, the market is up by 10%. Well, that means they're gonna get 30%, uh, you're gonna get 3% on your money in that particular case. And they put that right into your account. This is not how the insurance companies make money. They make money by investing their own money, basically their portion of the money. So 
you're going to get your 3% and that 3% goes right up into your account. And now that money can never be lost again. It's guaranteed. It's always going to be there because they had already set aside the other $2,500 for each of the years right at the beginning. So they don't need any of your earnings to make it work in later years. It's already preset from year one. But let's say just the opposite happened. Let's say the market dropped by 20%. Well, all they do is they had the right to buy the market, but they didn't have the obligation. So they just let the option expire. The $2,500 is gone. The $2,500 was going to be gone one way or the other. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist anymore at the end of the year. What ends up at the end of the year is you either have the right to buy that index at a higher price, sell it and make the difference, or it just expires and it's gone. So that way your guarantee is still in place and that's how indexed annuities make money. I know this is so hard. Uh, I, I hope I made that clear for you guys. Feel free to ask questions here at the end and, and I could try and explain it better if need be. So here's how they calculate the interest on an indexed annuity. There are three basic methods and two major variations and lots of minor variations. Last well, one time I counted them and I found there was 47 variations altogether. These are the main ones that you need to know and understand so that you know what kind of money you're going to make. And on the average, an indexed annuity is probably only going to make you around three, three and a half percent. Um, there are times, I mean, last year we did really, really well. A lot of people came in at seven or eight percent. Um, but on the average, on the average, because you have also have to remember, there's going to be years where you make nothing on an indexed annuity. You won't lose anything, but you won't make anything anytime the market goes down. Now, I'll mention it here real quick. I do um, provide a chart. I don't have one here um, at the moment, but it shows the S&P 500 index from 1950 all the way to 2019. It shows you the average return um, or what it did every year, whether it was up or down both by dollars and by uh, percentages. And what you'll see is that the market is up right at about 74% of the time. And it's usually up about 13%. And it's usually down about 13 or 14%. And that only happens about 25% of the time. So that's important to keep that in mind. If you want to see one of those charts, I'll gladly email you one. You can contact us later on about it. So anyway, the three methods for calculating the interest are we have the monthly average, the monthly sum, and the point to point. And we'll get into each of those here in just a second. And then the two major variations, um, once again, you got to give up something to get something. Um, you have what's called caps and you have what's called participation rates. So we'll get to that here in just a slide or two. So your monthly average, how they figure out the monthly average is they take the price of the index on the same day of each month. So let's just say the first of the month. And then they add up all 12 numbers for a year, of course, and then they divide by 12. And that gives you what the average was for the index for the entire year. So they compare that to the beginning number. They take the beginning number, they subtract one way or the other um, the ending number, or they subtract the beginning number from the ending number, and that determines the percentage. And then that is how they determine how much you're going to get paid for your interest if we're using monthly averaging. If we use monthly sum, also known as the monthly point to point, it's kind of a crossbreed because there is point to point coming up and we had the monthly average. So the monthly sum is a monthly point to point. It's the in-between one. So it looks at the percentage of change each month. So let's say the first month the uh, market is up 1%, you get a one in that column. And the next month it's up 2%, you get a, a two in that column. However, then they add up all the changes for the 12 months. But, uh, it's a big but, you, you have to remember this part of it. The up numbers have a limit. Currently that limit is at about 1.7%. So like when I just said, if the market was up 2% for the month, you don't actually get, they don't put a two in your column. They only put in a 1.7% in that column. The down months on the other side have no limit. So when you look at these, you could make 18%. Basically 1.7 times 12 is probably more like 19 or 20%. But, and once again, this is a really big but, 
Mark my words, the market, I don't think has ever gone up 12 months in a row, and I don't think it ever will go up 12 months in a row. There's always a weak spot here or there uh, that happens. So can you make a lot of money with this method? Yes, you absolutely can. But also remember, you could make a lot of money in the first 11 months and lose it all in the 12th month. Let's say it went up, you know, 1% every month for the first 11 months, you're at 11%. But then in the last month, the market drops by 10%. And you got to remember, market drops a lot faster than it goes up. Um, and, and it's totally possible that a market would drop 10% in one month. Well, here you thought you were way the heck ahead. And all of a sudden, at the end of the year, you only end up with 1% gain because they took 10 from all the ones. Um, so on the other hand, we always have some of the money in this choice. And most of the annuities, they give you, you can divvy up how much of your principal money do you want in each of these choices? And so we always put some in here because it's where you can make a whole lot of money at times. So anyway, then they add up the 12 numbers and the answer is the percentage of what they're going to pay on your money. So the last one is point to point. This is the simplest of the methods, of course. We start at point A and we finish at point B. What is the percentage of difference? And that is what you are going to earn subject to the next screen, the caps and the um, participation rates. So, um, and they can do this, they can do it either on a year basis, beginning, in, you know, they literally do 365 days. So it's not like they got to start January 1st. You could start March 5th or whatever the case may be to March 4th of the following year. So yearly is the most common point to point. There is a two year one. And then they, like I said, they have the monthly point to point back on the other one. Um, the thing to remember here, <laughs> I'm sorry to keep barking about this. You always have to give up something to get something. So because they're buying the options, is it cheaper to buy 12 options? In other words, monthly options, or is it cheaper to buy a one yearly option? Or is it cheaper yet to even buy a one, biannual option, a two-year option. Of course, the longer you go and you only have to buy an option once, it's going to be cheaper. The more often you have to buy options, the more that's going to cost you. So um, point to point was the original um, foundation of indexed annuities. Originally, that's all they had was point to point and they had one year, two year, and if I remember right, they had um, even a four year, maybe even longer than that. And then they started coming up with the other methods after that. But if you go back to 1995, uh, when these were first came out, this is what everybody was using at that point in time. And they worked perfectly fine and good. Okay, so your limitations. Earnings are limited by the variations and these are the caps and the participation rate. So what a cap is, they're going to tell you, okay, um, and currently because interest rates are so bad right now, the caps are really bad right now. And they're only at like two and a half percent, basically. So that means if you're using monthly averaging, um, they're going to tell you the most you're going to earn on that is two and a half percent. And this is why we divvy up the money because we know we can get closer to three, three and a half if we um, situate our money correctly. So on the other hand, when interest rates were just a year ago, when they were, you know, at, at uh, around 2% for the 10 year, then the caps were quite a bit higher. They were up around three, three and a half percent. So it's important to know what your caps are, um, both when you're buying it and throughout the course of owning the contract. The other way they can limit you is through participation rates. So instead of saying that they're going to cap you at two and a half percent, they're going to cap your participation rate. So like I said, uh, 25 and 30% is pretty common right now. Just a year ago, we had 50%, which was really great. That's where some of these people, uh, some of the contracts are coming in here at now. Um, some of these people made over 10% over on their index annuities last year because we had an over 50% participation rate. 40 is quite common. Right now, uh, interest rates are starting to climb back up. So I imagine, I can't hold me to this one because I don't get to make those decisions. But I imagine participation rates will start to climb back up because the 10-year interest rate is climbing back up. So there you have it. That is the... Um, limitations and basically index annuities. Oh, I want to go back one second. Be careful. A lot of people will tell you that 
their indexed annuity is going to grow by 8%. That's about 88% untrue if it's stated just that way. So they have a thing that's called the lifetime, in the, um, lifetime income benefit rider. And they do put in these guarantees that if you leave your money in here, we guarantee it's going to grow by 7% or 8%, but, but that only works if you turn it into a monthly income someday. If you cash it out instead, all bets are off. You did not earn the seven or eight percent. You earned what it actually earned. So, and even that seven or eight percent, when it's growing. So, let's say you know you have a hundred thousand and it grows by seven percent. At the end of the year, you have one hundred seven. That's the number they're going to use to decide how much they're going to pay you per month for the rest of your life. That's the only reason that number is used. You cannot cash out that seven thousand dollars. It doesn't exist. It's a figment. <clears throat> basically what does exist is how much did the annuity actually make that year maybe it only made three or four percent and so if you wanted to cash it out that's what you're going to get you can get your hundred thousand plus the three or four thousand that it earned you are never going to get that seven thousand they only use that number to determine how much they're going to pay you on a monthly basis so if somebody's telling you that they have an annuity variable annuity or indexed annuity or any annuity that's paying seven or eight percent and they don't disclose that that only works if you take as monthly income. That's all that's growing is the monthly income is growing by 7%, not the cash value. Put on your track shoes and start running in the opposite direction because they're not telling you the whole story and you're about to get had. So speaking of getting had, let's talk about variable annuities just for a second. I'm almost done here. The variable annuities, these are actually what gives annuities a black eye. A lot of people go, oh, I hear annuities are terrible. They're expensive and, and they're just... A, a terrible investment. Variable annuities, I'm not going to say they're a terrible, terrible investment, but they are totally a different dog. Um, they're not one and the same thing. They are very expensive. They have a lot of fees attached to them. They have mortality fees attached to them. They have lifetime income benefit rider fees attached to them. They have fees because they are investing inside of the stock market. And so they are not safe. They have some guarantees. They have to understand that guarantee. They have what's called a high watermark guarantee. So let's say your 100,000 grew to 120,000, but now you want to cash out. You want to take your money out. But the market went down since then. Now it's only worth 110. Well, if you want to take your cash out, you're only going to get the 110. If you want the 120, you guessed it once again, you have to take that as monthly income for as long as you live. It's the only way you will ever get um, that extra $10,000. So that's how those work. Um, I do not represent these, so I'm not going to uh, go deeper into uh, the variable annuities. Okay, so how are they used? They're the only product in the world that can, and that where they do guarantee you a monthly income for as long as you live, regardless of how long you live. The payout guarantees lifetime payments but also 10 or 20 years worth of payments to someone other than you if you don't make it that long. So this is one of those worries a lot of people have to go, well, what if I turn into a lifetime income in two years from now, I croak? Well, what happens to the rest of the money? Well, normally when we set these up as a lifetime payment, we set it up with the guarantee that somebody's going to get that money for either 10 years or 20 years, or they'll just pay out the difference of what you have not collected. And so that's basically how they work. Um, it's how they always should work. And it's a choice that you get to make. Once again, you'll get a higher payout if, if you take a 10 year as compared to a 20 year, but it's your choice. It's your choice on how that happens. Or you could just even take a refund feature and not have the 10 or 20 year at all in there. So, um, so how are they used? as a good safe investment alternative that earns a reasonable rate of return. They help you keep more of your money in your own pockets. If you look in your book, um, in your copy of my book, right on, on the front cover, it says, uh, making money is easy, keeping it is the hard part. And when you get into the introduction of the book, I've talked about this, I've preached about this, I swear by this. My job is to help you folks keep your money in your pockets. I don't want you losing it to Wall Street. I don't want you losing it to the government. I don't want you losing it to the insurance companies. I want you to have it in your pocket so you can use it for what you want to use it for. 
That's what annuities do. You'll never get rich buying an annuity. You won't, but you'll never go poor either. And so how I do suggest that people use annuities, here's just a couple of quick ways and then we'll turn this over to the Q&A portion. But a lot of times people have money in an IRA and they have money, a lot of that money or all, all of it is in the stock market. I have no problems with people having their money in the stock market. Like I said, the market goes up 75% of the time. We're almost crazy not to have money in the market. But where the crime comes in, is when you get forced into selling when the market is down. And the market is down 25% of the time. Well, the government, when it comes to the IRAs, makes you take your money out. Well, we never want to take money, we never want to get forced into accepting a loss or taking a loss to get our money out. So if we have two piles of money, we have our stock market money and we have our annuity money. Now, when the market goes down, the market has always come back and there's no reason to believe that it won't continue to do that in the future. So when it's down, what you want to do is you want to leave it alone and give it time to come back up. So in that case, if the market's down, down here, then we take the money out of the annuities instead because we know that's 100% safe and all the money is there. And that way we're not getting forced into taking a loss and it's giving this money time to work its way back up. So in the Bad years, you take the money out of the stock market. In the good, you know, in the good years, you take the money out of the stock market side. In the bad years, you take it out of the fixed indexed annuity side. And I use those because they make more than the banks do or more than even the fixed. And so you still get some benefit from being tied to the performance of the market. So, like I said, it will never make you rich, but they will never let you go broke. That's the presentation. Thanks so, thanks so much, Ron. That was really interesting. You know, um, I, 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 you know, do a lot of investing, and I always find uh, annuities to be quite, quite uh, um, um, uh, confusing. Um, and and I, I know we had some people in here asking questions like, you know, uh, can you can you t can you explain better the participation rates, and can you explain why? The insurance company would have a cap um, uh, on on the upside, but no cap on the downside. So why why is it why is it so unfriendly to the investor um, in that in that situation? And can you can you take some time to explain the participation rates? Okay, so participation rate, like I said, has a lot to do with prevailing interest rates, because um, like I showed on the one slide there. If they're only making 3% of their money, then they have to invest the 75,000 to have the 100,000 at the end. Well, if they were making 5% on their money instead, then they don't have to invest like 60,000, which would give them $40,000 to buy more options with. The more options you could buy or what's called, uh, this gets a little bit involved, but closer to the money. It, it, on options trading, and just so you know, I do not sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or any of that stuff, or options, or any of that stuff. But I help educate on it. So in options trading, you have what's called in the money and out of the money. In the money means if the market today is selling for thirteen twenty nine, then thirteen twenty nine and lower is in the money. If you're buying an option for thirteen forty, you're out of the money, and you're hoping it's going to get up there. So this is kind of how options work. Well, the more money you have the closer you can come to being in the money and the more options you can buy to um, earn money with if the market does go up. So a lot of it has to do with the prevailing interest rates. The insurance companies certainly aren't out to be unfair or, or to um, take advantage of people. They're doing the best they can to help you make money. It, it, that's what they want to do. But also protecting their business model. Well, yeah, yeah, because this is there's been many fights going on. You know, uh, the SEC and stuff would love to get their hands on indexed annuities because um, they think it's a it's a stock market product, but it's not because the stock market has no product that guarantees you cannot lose money, and that is the whole point behind these is they have to do everything they can 
to make sure you don't lose money. That is number one priority. Making money is not the number one priority. Not losing money is the number one priority. Now, how, much, how many nickels can we squeeze out with what we have left? And, and so that's the concept. Of, yeah, but on their side, the, 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 they, 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 they know their models so well. They know what their, what their earnings rate is gonna be over time, no matter what. I mean, even though that, even though you might say, "Oh, their their job is to not lose money," they don't lose money because, un, unless it's a very unusual situation, I'm not saying they never do, but mo for the most part, their models are set up to make money off of the people who are giving them money to set up the annuity so that they have a lifetime guarantee. True. So, like when I said they're making three percent, they're probably actually making more like four, four and a half. Three is what they can afford to pay you. Mm -hmm. um, so because that's how they make their money is, yeah, they invest it and, and they're invested in corporate bonds and, and uh, government bonds and, and different things. And yeah, they're shooting for, you know, that four, four and a half, somewhere in there uh, type percent. And it costs them one and a half, two percent to run their business. Mm -hmm. That's how they make their money. And you're right, that's all built in. And that's why with index annuities, there are no fees because all this is already built in. So then they go, okay, so we're making, let's call it four just to be just for example and they know that they can run their entire business on 1.75 percent of all the billions that they manage they can run their business pay all their employees pay all their bills make their profit pay their taxes everything by make 1.75 that leaves 2.25 that they could pay to the people now the choice is do they pay that 2.25 in a fixed annuity which they're paying 1.75 right now. Mm -hmm. So do they pay it that way and just guarantee you you're going to make your 1.75, which makes a lot of people happy. A lot of people are thrilled to death to get 1.75 on three-year annuity right now. Mm -hmm. Shoot, six weeks ago, we had 2.4, believe it or not. And we did. We told the people when that was running out and they all came running in. <clears throat> Sorry. So they had that 1.75 that they could pay you on a fixed or... They can keep that and use it to buy the options on the market to try and help you earn more money. Did that and answer so, your question? So, Ron, yeah, yeah, you didn't explain the one part though. Is why the is the option, why well participation rate? What is it? And then the second part is is why is the downside uh, uncapped but the upside is capped? Well, is there an easy way to explain this? It has isn't that just do. isn't that just isn't that just favoring the insurance company 100 no. percent no 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 because they i think you need to understand that the insurance company on all these options they do not make any money on that they do not make any money on that they don't count on any of that that is all for the um the clients benefits just They've to make sure they their... have enough money to pay that forever sorry just so they they can guarantee that that annuity can be paid for a lifetime, no matter how long that is. Right, right, exactly. So the prevailing interest rate has a lot to do with the participation rate. Like I said, the more money that they have left over to buy options with, the higher participation rate we get. The lower the interest rate, the less money they have to buy options with, the lower the participation rate is going to be. So, like so, so right yeah. now we have very low participation rates because the interest rates are so low. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Got it. And, and that's what determines that participation rate totally. It, it's not the insurance company deciding, gee, how much do we want to make or not make? It all has to do with how much money is left over to be trading the options with to make the money. Yeah, I think I think that's one of those ones where where you you might want to go spend a little bit of time on the internet and do your own reading because I I think participation rates are pretty confusing. Um, but let's not spend all our time on that. Let's talk about the pension exclusion in Colorado. The pension exclusion um, amounts. Uh, perhaps you can talk about that. Maybe you don't know Colorado's like they're, they're twenty and twenty four thousand, but um, it's twenty four. Yeah. yeah. So could you explain you explain what that means to a to to a retiree? Sure. So if you're age 55 to 65, it's 20,000. If you're 65 or over, it's 24,000 of pension incomes. So what pension income is, 
is it's money coming out of 401ks, it's money coming out of IRAs, it's money coming out of annuities, it's money coming taxable uh, social security benefits. But it's only and, state, this is only a state pension uh, exclusion, correct? It's not right. federal. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no federal, there is no federal pension exclusion. No, no, they, they want all their money. Does um, every state have a pension exclusion, Ron? No, no. Some states, do, some states don't. Um, some of them are um, just a partial exclusion like ours. There's a couple that are full exclusion. Um, it varies quite a bit from state to state. So if um, the, where that comes in, a lot of people don't use that whole thing because a lot of times the pension that's getting taxed is their social security. And a lot of people don't get $24,000 a year in social security. And it is per person. It's not per household or, or you know, per couple. It's per person. Um, and so it makes quite a bit of difference. I mean, you know, 5% on $24,000, that, that's $1,000. You know, that's quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and Ron, perhaps um, you could perhaps give me your opinion on, on I've heard some, some government employees that have the option of converting their pensions into an annuity. Um, how does that work and, and is it, is it, is it beneficial? Depends on the person. Mostly, absolutely. Yes. And they're actually trying to pass a law to where they'll give you better tax treatment. If you'll do that with your 401k and turn it into a monthly income, because the government doesn't want you depending on them in the end. They, they want people to use their 401ks as pensions. I mean, that's what they were built for was to be pensions. So what it does for you is it does guarantee that you cannot run out of money. If you don't do that, um, some people are not very responsible with their money. They, they tend to, it's there, it must be there to be spent, you know, and, and they go through it. Whereas, and then all of a sudden, 10 years later, they have no money left. Whereas if they had set up uh, a monthly income for as long as they live, they'd always have that. Um, so, I think everybody should do that to a certain extent, not with all their money necessarily. We kind of do it backwards. We, we talk with people, okay, how much money do you need? And we put an inflation factor. And then we use enough of their retirement monies to turn it into a monthly income to make sure that they always have that. So all the basics are always gonna be covered. And then the rest of it, we leave more as a lump sum to be used for emergencies or whatever the case may be later on down the road, maybe give themselves a raise because so let, things are let, let's take more. let's take a practical example. Um, a couple has uh, you know thirty five to forty thousand dollars a year coming in in Social Security income. They've done a good job. They've saved five hundred thousand dollars in their four hundred one ks. They're sixty five and now retired, collecting their uh, full uh, full. Social Security at this point, um, would you recommend to them to take a portion of that uh, 401k and move it into an annuity? And wouldn't it, and what are the tax implications of that? There, there are no, there are no tax implications to the actual movement. It's only when you take money out. If you move, so if you move money from a, from one 401k into an annuity, that's going to pay you a monthly income. The minute you start taking that monthly income out of that annuity, or you start that annuity up at that monthly income, that's when you'll pay taxes on it. And the tax, there would be a tax benefit though, taking money out of your annuity versus taking money out of your 401k, correct? Because of the Colorado exclusion, yes, yes. So what I suggest in a case like that is, um, from when we first figure out how much monthly more income do they need, you know, and we go off of that. But then the other part is, because you said there's like $500,000 and it's in a 401k, it goes back to that part where I like to have the people have enough money in the annuity to meet the minimum required distributions. Um, because at age 72 now, by the way, that did change mm -hmm. from 70 and a half to 72, uh, we have to take money out of our IRA. I don't want people taking it out of the stock market if the stock market is down 30 or 40%. I leave it alone, it's gonna come back, it's gonna do okay. So what I want, I would want them to do is, let's say 500,000 and it's basically about 4% is what you have to take out as required minimum distribution, mm -hmm. 45%. So that means $25,000 a year. So 
and you could take out 10% of an annuity without any penalties and all that stuff. So basically, in this case, it's going to work out to you put about $250,000 in the index annuity, but the, keep the other 250 where it's at in the stock market, wherever. And now if the market's down, you could pull your whole 25,000 because the IRS doesn't care which account you take it out. Of. You just have to get the right amount out. They don't, you don't have to do it per account. You just do it per whole. So now you can take out your $25,000 a year out of the annuity while the market is down. Wait till it comes back up. When it comes back up, stop taking it from the annuity and take it from the market again. And so that just brings in balance and a huge safety net, a lot of flexibility for the people. Yeah, and that, that seems to me for people who have really relied on investing money in a 401k and have built up a big balance, that seems to me to be the most practical use of annuities for that type of investor, correct? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, there's your opinion. There's my opinion. There's their yeah. opinion. Yeah. I mean, everybody, right. right. There, are, right there are lots of people with different opinions. Right for them. But, uh, but it yeah, seems, that exactly. seems like a practical option for somebody who wants a monthly income but doesn't want to have to rely on taking it out of their 401k on minimum minimum distributions. Right. Or the other big thing is the ones who want to guarantee themselves that monthly income for as long as they live, because there's no way a 401k can do that for you. Right. Right. You know, Interesting. 401k can lose money, can run out of money. Annuity can never run. If, if you turned it into a monthly payment, they can never run out of money. Ron, are there any hidden fees associated with annuities to sign up? Uh, uh, is there a charge from the uh, from the uh, if you're using a financial a financial person to buy the annuity through the insurance company? Are they typically typically tacking on a quarter or half a percent uh, fee to, uh, to 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 get it all set up, or is that usually the insurance company just says no? This is a a no fee situation to get into the annuity. Right, they do call it a no fee. And goes back to what I said, when they figured out that they need 1.75% on the money per year to pay all their bills, part one of those bills that they have to pay is people like me, you know, the, the people who, who uh, sell these annuities. So that's already prefigured into that. Now there is one exception. Some um, variations have what's called a yield spread. So instead of hitting you with the participation rate, they say, okay, we'll pay you whatever the market earns but not the first 3%. We get the first 3% because that's the cost of doing business and then you get the rest. So there are a few out there. Um, yeah, like I said, there's a few. So I don't wanna say that there are never any fees. 90% of the indexed annuities have no fees. Fixed annuities have no fees, absolutely, um, ever. Um, so yeah, the vast majority have no fees. Now variable annuities have huge fees. Um, huge, huge. Um, they'll run anywhere from two and a half to five percent per year, whether or not you made money. You, you you're gonna pay that one. So um, yeah, variables a, a whole different animal. Doesn't sound like to me that there would be many people on this call that would probably be interested in that product. Um, so if so, so as a closing comment, Ron, as a piece of advice to our to our listeners. Um, uh, what would you say to them in terms of, hey, I have some interest, but I want to understand these better. What would you What would you say to them to to do the basics to get educated on this? Besides listening to you, of course, or reading your book. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good start. Read um, your book and <laughs> and where can we buy that book, Ron? <laughs> um, it's on Amazon. You okay, great. I Amazon. just wanted, I wanted to give you that chance. <laughs> Or, or you can call the office. Um, they sell for $15 and uh, we can ship it out to you, whatever the case may be. So it is in there. There is um, a couple places. There's one, there's a guy named, um, shoot, his last name is Marion. It's called the Index Compendium. Compendium. And he talks about them quite in depth. And he's not, it uh, doesn't work for any insurance companies or anything. Thing like that. He's just a statistical guy. That's his business. He does statistics and stuff. Um, and so uh, he's written a, a lot of stuff about him. Um, he and I both, I mean, we've been around these things since they first came out in 1995. As a matter of fact, I know the guy who actually invented the concept of the index and of these. I met him a couple of times in my life. Pure genius. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you, you can look on the internet. 
almost what's more important once you get the concept, you know, a, a, okay, a fixed annuity is basically a CD done by a insurance company instead of a bank. Mm -hmm. No big difference there. Guarantees are a little bit different, but they're both guaranteed. You're safe. You're good. It's same with the credit unions. Credit unions are not FDIC insured. The NCUA insured. I mean, so every industry has its own way of insuring these things, including the insurance industry. Um, and then the index annuities, they are, are kind of tough, but once you understand the concept, you know, okay, they can go up, they cannot go down. You're not going to get rich. You're not going to ever go broke. You know, th that's the concept of it. Um, then what's most important actually is what's right for you. Every person is different. Their time horizon is different. What they want to do with their money uh, and when they want to do it is different. How much they're going to need. Um, whether they have tax problems or not that we're trying to minimize. I mean, everybody is different. A lot of people, sometimes they'll come into me and I'll go, okay, so tell me what you want. And they go, well, I want to make more money. I go, no, you don't. And they go, yeah, I do. I want to make more money. I go, no, you don't. That's not what you really want. Tell me what you really want. And I go, no, I really want to make more money. I go, okay, if you made more money, what would you do with it? Well, I want to be able to pay for the first year of college for each of my grandkids. I go, okay, that's what you want. Now we have a goal to aim at, you know, more money. Money is just a tool. Money should never be the final object or the final goal. It's what is the money going to be used for? I painstakingly take the time to make sure I understand that for each person so I can help them come to the right conclusion for them because everybody's different. And, and I realize that. I've had lots of people, they come in and they go, oh, these sound so good. I really think I wanna do this. After I look at their situation, I go, this really is not the appropriate way for you to get to where you wanna go, you know, for one reason or another. And um, other people, you know, I've had, are we out of time? How close are we on time? Yeah, we're we're we're, we're we're right at the end, Ron. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to stop there. But um, it's 102. Uh, I want to thank everyone today for joining us. Very complicated but interesting subject. Um, and you know, obviously, everyone on this call is probably impacted by it. I know I am. So I appreciate uh, Ron all your information. Uh, again, if you're really interested, you can pick up Ron's book. And um, I thank you all for joining us. Can I give my phone number real quick? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the office is right there in Longmont. You're live from Las Vegas today because I'm taking a break out here, but um, the, the office number is 303-776-0867. We're right there in Longmont and basically 21st of Maine. Wonderful. Thanks so much again, Ron. And I, I hope uh, anybody that's on this call will join us for one of our one of our upcoming sessions every day at this time. So thanks so much again and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.